Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi. I'm a freshman at UCLA and co-host this podcast with Jill. And I'm Jill Wine Banks. And since we're interviewing an author and talking about his book, I have to say I'm also an author of The Watergate Girl, which I hope everyone will read. I'm an MSNBC legal analyst and, of course, former Watergate prosecutor and former general counsel of the Army, something that's more relevant today than um, in most days of my life. Um, but today we're thrilled to be joined and Victor is going to introduce our guest. Yeah, so today we are really thrilled to be joined by Anand Giridatis, a prolific writer and former columnist for the New York Times. His latest book, Winner Take All, The Elite Charade of the Changing World is something that we want to talk about today. And in addition to being an author of this and many other books, Anand is an editor at large for Time, an on-air political analyst for MSNBC, and a visiting scholar at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at NYU. Thank you so much for being here today, Anand. So happy to be with you both. Yeah, so we want to get right into your book. Um, you know, there are so many books out there talking about, you know, what is described as our broken economic system that benefits the rich while the rest of society suffers. But I really found your book extraordinarily engaging and thought provoking. And I want to start with a part of the book that I actually found the most interesting, which is the title. Um, so can you kind of walk us through how you came up with that title? Uh, the truth is, I did not. Um, you know, Jill may have similar experiences, I don't know. But the, the book world is a strange world where you actually have a lot of control over what's between the, the hardcover, uh, the pages themselves, mm -hmm. more than you do if you write for a newspaper, say. So, you know, if in general, in the book publishing world, if your editor says that sentence is bad or that, and you say, no, I, I want to keep it, generally speaking, unless it's libelous, you, <laughs> you win. The presumption goes to the author, uh, mm -hmm. except when it comes to the cover and the title. Uh, so what happened was, and I've never told this story before, we, I've had this difficulty with all three of my books and it's just, it's, it's a challenge, right? Cause you're putting everything you've done for years on the line. And um, I don't know if you've ever done this, Jill, but like I have stood in bookstores and watched anthropologically how people interact with books. Someone told me to do this actually in my first book. Like I've watched, like, cause I was interested in like, how long do people, how, how quickly do you walk by each like stand with like 40 books on it? How quick, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and the answer is like two seconds. Um, when someone stops at a stand, like how many books do they like look at or t And the answer is like two or three. Like what's the time? And it's, if you actually look at people in a bookstore, it is terrifying. You realize you have like this much time to grab somebody. Uh, unless you're like already, you know, Michael Jordan. And so, <laughs> um, and so I was aware of that. And so the booksellers, the publishers are very adamant that they know, you know, they have expertise here. So I had all these ideas. I'll tell you what I wanted to call Winners Take All. I wanted to call it Hijacked. That was the title on the manuscript that I submitted, Hijacked. And it was, I think, Hijacked, the hostile takeover of changing the world. Um, and I thought that kind of hostile takeover corporate language was good and hijacked and democracy has been hijacked. Yeah. Um, people thought it was too violent. I think my agent thought it was too violent. Uh, I thought that was kind of a good thing, but um, they, so, so we went on and on and on. And, uh, and, and one day uh, my editor just said, winners take all. And I was like, well, that, that has nothing to do with what I'm saying. I mean, that's like, that's the outcome, but it's not, that's not the move that this fake do good. It had nothing. It says nothing of the actual thing that the book's trying to be a original contribution on. And he was like, it doesn't matter. It grabs people. And it says the consequence of what you're describing because of everything that's in this book, the winners take all. And then you can explain it in the subtitle. Um, the great writer, Catherine Boo helps me with the subtitle. Um, so I did basically almost none of it myself. <laughs> it's so interesting, but I, I have to just answer what you said, which is, it was a shock to me about how much they control the cover. I, I hated and still hate this picture. My hair is blowing. My eyes are squinting. My skirt is blowing between my legs. I would have never picked that picture, but the publisher picks the cover picture mm. and the layout. I, I, 
did get them to add a red binding. So this was so gray, black, white, gray. Um, I would have loved a red border. Um, and the title, when it was first proposed, I had two pages of possible titles, none of which was this. And they said, Watergate Girl. And I said, never in my life will I allow my name to be on a book with girl. And they said, hold on a second. What captures the era better than girl? What were you called? I went, oh, well, yeah, that's true. And they said, and let me point out how many bestsellers have girl in the title. Girl with the dragon tattoo, girl on the train, and they went on and on. I went, okay. And you know what? At this point, I think the Watergate girl captures the book in a way that nothing that I proposed could. So I love it. It's, mm -hmm. it's a brilliant suggestion. And I now am enthusiastic about it. But you're, you're right about book publishing. It's a very interesting thing. And, and it's, you know, like so many things in life, you have to know when to fight and you have to know when to trust other people, you know, and, and it's important to do both often in the same process, um, you know, but the, the titles are the kind of thing where these, that's really where these folks know a lot more than you do. Even if you're the author, you know, the words they know, they have, you know, they don't publish one thing every four years, they publish 400 things every one year. And they know, you know, they have their war stories of things that just didn't catch, things that just didn't poke. And so I, that's the kind of an area where I really did learn a lot from, um, from them. And, you know, even the cover, it, had this, it was this white, kind of plain white thing with a gold coin, very simple lettering. I wanted, I kind of wanted like a fist, like a resistance fist with a Rolex watch on it which I thought kind of would capture this notion of, of you know, elite pseudo revolutionaries. Um, and they were like, no, simple, clean, big idea. And I was so angry about it. And, you know, they were right. Well, I, I agree with you because what I ended up saying to them is, look, I wouldn't let you make decisions on how I do a trial. So I'm not going to interfere in how you publish a book. You do know more than I do. That's your job. And so I'm going to go with your professional opinion. If you think this is the right title and the right cover, then we're doing it. Um, I'll tell you one other thing that my agent said to me about book editor and author relationships that I, again, I think is a profound point for a lot of relationships, which is she said, you know, often when an editor, this is not the cover, this is like the content of the book. When an editor has a problem with something in your book, um, they're often wrong about what the problem is, but they're right that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And what you have to understand, you have to separate um, the content of their warning from the fact that they are trying to tell you something that you actually need to hear. And that has often been true for me with my books that you know, you're in it, they're outside it, they may not actually get it right, they may not see the hole at the beginning, they may be actually in the, in the details wrong but if you use that to brush the whole thing off, you're missing information. There is information. And I, I you know, I, when I go on TV and people say mean things about me, like I try to take information from everything. You know, um, I learned from being on Morning Joe. I, I wore a, uh, I think I wore a tie once, a button, you know, suit, suited up, buttoned up, tie and everything. And I learned from some of these awful racist trolls that I don't have a, much of a neck. Now, these people are mean and they're vicious, but a case, and they just say these terrible things. But in that case, it was actually that it contained a kernel of truth. And I didn't look as good in a, you know, a shirt covering my full neck as I was open. And I, I asked a friend of mine who knows a little about fashion, and she's like, look, these people are assholes, but they're they're like a little right. So just just wear t-shirts with your jackets or wear open shirt, you know, so you learn something from your critics. Wow, wow. That, that is interesting. My yeah. editor was a gem. I never had any disagreements. He substantially improved my book. Paul Golub, genius. Um, first editor, Paul Golub was the first editor of my, of no. my first book, yeah. Oh my God, oh, uh. that's so fantastic. He's a genius. He absolutely was brilliant. 
So wow. anyways, what let's a small get world. Your book. Yes. I mean, this, is, this has been a fascinating kind of dive into, into the book industry. And for any aspiring author or non-author out there, just listen to your editor. Um, that's simple advice. All right. So let's get into, or before we get into the crux of the book, um, which we could talk about literally for hours, I want you to help our, understand, uh, help our audience understand some of the key terms in your book. And I think as I was reading it, these five kind of came up. It was plutocrats, neoliberalism, Carnegieism, market world, and philanthropy. Um, so I guess, why don't we start with the first term and have you define that just to like have like a baseline understanding of what it is. So let's start with plutocrats first and then make our way down that list. Plutocrats, I'm not a Latin scholar, but, but some of them I can do the Latin. Uh, <sighs> you know, Pluto is rich and crat means ruling. Right. As in a Democrat, small d Democrat, democracy is people ruling. Um, so plutocracy is not inequality. It's not just there happened to be a there happens to be a divide. It's not just that there happens to be a lot of rich people. It is rich people. It is rule by rich people. It is rule on the basis of wealth, not just rule by rich people. I think it's actually rule by rich people for the purpose of protecting their wealth. And America today functions in many ways like a plutocracy. Um, when the tax code is written in such a way that a very large number of Fortune 500 companies do not pay federal income taxes anymore, that is an example of what plutocracy looks like. Um, so, you know, plutocracy is a very simple way to understand it is when, uh, as often happens in society, there's a fork in the road a decision about what's good for money and what's good for people, which wins. And a plutocracy, what's good for money, wins. Mm. All right. Um, all right. So next we have neoliberalism. This is a tough one. And it's the kind of thing, it's one of these many, there are many things like this where if we defined it better at a better term for it, it'd be easier to beat, <laughs> you know? Um, it's like patriarchy is another one of the, you know, it's just like these terms where like, it's really important that people understand these things, but somehow the terms don't help the cause. Um, so neoliberalism is, is a, in some ways, it, it, it is connected to a view that the best society is achieved by leaving markets unfettered and free and by, by leaving capitalists to do their thing. But I think the particular wrinkle when we talk about neoliberalism in this era is the notion that a lot of traditionally liberal goals would actually be best advanced through that kind of right-wing approach. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you look at the Cokes, they're in a sense not neoliberals in this narrower sense that I'm defining it. They're just traditional, like, leave me alone because I want to make as much money as possible, pollute as much as possible, and grab as much political power as possible. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing two-sided about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's full of integrity in a sense. I mean, it's a full, like, coherent and very dangerous worldview with no head fakes. Um, if you look, on the other hand, at you know, um, the politics of a Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or Tony Blair, these types of leaders, there is a sense, of, I'm not a Koch brother at all. Like I value equality and justice and empowerment of the least among us and racial justice, all those goals. However, I have come to the view that the best thing we can do for systemic racism is empower black entrepreneurs. And I've come to the view that the best thing we can do for women is to invest in coding classes for young girls. And the best thing we can do uh, to you know, narrow income inequality is to uh, you know, have charter schools uh, so that there's more competition in our education system. In other words, it is in some ways more insidious than pure right-wing ideology because it suggests, no, 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 we hear you. E equality is important, justice is important, and don't worry. The market's got that too. Hmm. I, and I think that brings us into our next definition, which is market world. And this is something that comes up throughout your book. Um, so let's have you explain that as well. So market world is my own term. Uh, one word, capital M, capital mm -hmm. W. I learned a long time ago in journalism, like coinage is very important. Um, and the reason I did that, and coinage is, is, is very important in a particular circumstance where, you know, often in the kind of writing I do, sometimes you are 
literally or figuratively going far away and bringing people home information that they have no connection to. Like I went to Sichuan province many years ago and ate extraordinary, you know, Sichuanese food for a week and had weird banquets in these underground caverns and I had wild experiences that people outside of China would not find familiar. And in that kind of case, when you're doing that kind of writing, you don't have to do much. You just say what happened. If you just say what happened, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to people. It'll be a different experience for people. There's another kind of writing and winners take all falls in the second category where you are actually, the stuff you're writing about is not far away at all. It is, it is the stuff right in front of people. It's the ads they watch every day on TV. It's the politicians they vote for or don't vote for. It's the companies they work for or buy products from. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to turn things they know well to which they are habituated. You're trying to turn them into Sichuan province in a sense, right? You're trying to actually exoticize something that is not unfamiliar to people. You're trying to actually make people take something like Amazon pays no taxes, which we're all actually completely used to, inured to. You're trying to make people go, whoa, Amazon pays no taxes. Mm -hmm. And so these are, it's interesting that these are just two, and I've, I do, I've done both in my career as a foreign correspondent in India, everything in, in that category, you know, falls under that kind of first thing of like, you're describing an, a, a reality that is alien to a lot of people reading it. But in the second category, it's really important to use tools of writing to defamiliarize the familiar. Um, and the term market world was coined to try to suggest to people that a lot of different things in their society that they may think of as being different are actually part of a common phenomenon, a common network of people, a common understanding of the world that, that exists in a certain sphere. And so I wanted people to believe and understand that TED Talks as a phenomenon, what goes on there, who pays for them, what ideas you get out of TED Talks because of who's paying for them, that that is a phenomenon connected to what jobs young people do when they come off campus, mm -hmm. which is in turn connected to how activism is distorted by philanthropic grant making, which is in turn connected to you know, how big philanthropy uses targeted generosity to cover up injustice. And those are all different phenomenon as most people understand them. I wanted to use a term to scoop up this and I describe in the book, market world is a network. It is a culture, it's a state of mind, but it's a group of people who fundamentally believe that the best way to empower people is through the market, neoliberalism, and that, and that fundamentally it is possible to do good by the world while and by doing well for yourself. Wow, that's so fascinating. I think you also mentioned, so um, one other definition on here is, or term on here is philanthropy. And I think philanthropy is often a, a, I guess for me, when I first started reading your book, I thought of philanthropy as a, a good term or something that, you know, it, it's generosity, but describe what you mean by philanthropy in the book. Well, this is also interesting, right? I mean, I'm, and I'm glad you're focusing on terms. So the word philanthropy is relatively new, at least in the way we understand it today. So if you take a different word that's related and maybe interchangeable for most people, charity, mm -hmm. that's a different story, right? Charity goes back as far as people go back. Uh, every religion calls for it uh, that I know of. There are, you know, it is embedded in certain holidays. It's, and it's something, by the way, people do at all levels of society. I mean, in fact, in, in this country, as in most countries, poor people give a much higher fraction of their income away than rich people do. Um, and so the idea of charity is as old as time. Philanthropy is not that. Philanthropy is a term that, you know, as people, practitioners, and scholars use it, really refers to mega giving by mega fortunes. And that phenomenon is a hundred plus years old. Andrew Carnegie being one of the patrons, patron saints of it, which we can get to. But, you know, it was when you, one way to think about it that, that helps me is when you started to have the Rockefellers and Carnegie's and Coopers of that, of that time, and they started to do charity by virtue of how big their fortunes were. This is a post-industrial revolution era where you started to have a significant number of people with like king and queen money, right? Not like the rich guy in your town who has a hat store, who's like, 
you know, has twice the income of everybody else in town, right? There's, that's a certain kind of wealth, like or in a village in India that I would have covered where there's some farmer who owns 300 acres instead of three acres. I mean, that's a kind of wealth, but you had after the industrial revolution in the United States, some of these fortunes where king and queen wealth, right? And so when a Rockefeller or Carnegie started giving money away, they were quasi states from the beginning, right? And that's only gotten truer. When Bill Gates wants to do something on malaria, he is quite quickly one of the most powerful actors on earth on malaria. If he decides he wants to have more science in American education, he's not necessarily more powerful than the federal government. He is certainly more powerful than any state government, maybe with the exception of New York and California on that issue, immediately from just by virtue of the size of those fortunes. And so what you had with the rise of big philanthropy 100 plus years ago, continuing to the present, is giving and charity that is barnacled with questions about influence, about uh, power, about whether it is appropriate, we all make mistakes, whether it's appropriate for some people's mistakes to ramify through an entire society uh, just because they had an idea. Um, questions about whether philanthropy can be used, is often used as a form of reputation laundering to wash the stink off of people who made their money by hurting society. Um, and those are some of the questions that came into play mm -hmm. when you shifted from merely having people, individual people at all levels giving back to people really becoming you know, quasi feudal empires through the act of giving. Right. I mean, so it's such a, com you, you offer such a complex, I guess, argument, but it's also understandable, but I just want to kind of try to summarize your argument um, for our audience and then get into the specifics of the book. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, you know, your argument is that, you know, rich people sh um, engage in philanthropy in an attempt to improve the world. But in reality, they are the ones who are kind of creating the problems that they're trying to solve, which ultimately worsens the um, social, racial and economic systems in our country. Would that be like a fair summary of um, your argument in your book? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's very good. All right. Sounds great. Um, and then can you give us some examples of what you mean? Because, you you know, you mentioned Bill Gates, but one thing that I found um, on the back cover of your book was that Bill Gates reviewed your book. Um, so um, give some examples of what you mean by that um, and just to help our um, audience kind of see that. Yeah, I'll do that in a second. But I'll, I'll tell you the story behind the Bill Gates thing. It's kind of funny. <laughs> um, he wrote, he did write a blurb for the book, uh, you know, and then and then like three months later when he was in Davos, he insinuated that I was a communist in an interview with the New York Times. So, you know, that was- well, let me just say for our audience, you certainly are probably our most radical guest. So <laughs> for all those who are listening, and this is your first time listening, this is a radical viewpoint. But it's a, well, it's a, it's a, it's a I, good- I, I, But that we're trying to expose everyone to um, a, a range of, of viewpoints. And th mm -hmm. this would be, uh, I think, an interesting thing for us to think about as we enter a new administration sure. who could make differences in how we pay taxes and mm -hmm. et cetera. So go yeah, ahead. And, and, and I, I would say that, you know, um, uh, you know, with Gates, I finished the book, then you need to go get these blurbs when it's coming out. It's a total pain. <laughs> and I made... I made a list of people that I wanted, mostly writers, and they kind of vouched for it. And I started looking at the list and thinking, ah, this is gonna, I'm not, uh, this is gonna be too hard. None of these people are gonna do it. What am I gonna do? I was not feeling great about the book. And so then I got this genius idea, according to me. Uh, I made a second list. I was like, if none of these people do it, what I'll do is, I will ask a bunch of very, very wealthy plutocrats to do it. And they will all say no, but their offices will all send me like a sentence of rejection. Like Gary Cohn of <laughs> Goldman Sachs is unable to blurb this book. You know, hmm. uh, Roger Altman is unable to review this book. And then I would collect like six or seven of the rejections and I would put that on the cover. And I thought it was such a great solution. So I had these two lists. I was going to try both strategies. And then I had literally one person who I wrote atop the piece of paper in handwriting who straddled the two lists and it was Bill Gates. I was like, I could see Bill Gates 
I could see him going this way and I could see him going that way. So I was like, let me try. Since he's, since he's, since I don't know which direction I'm going to go, let's try him. And he might give me an indication of which path is going to work. So I tried. And to my surprise, they're like, we'll take it to him. And uh, they took it to him. It took months. And uh, there was some guy on paternity leave who was like the book reviewer gatekeeper. And then came back and was like, yeah, here's Bill Gates' blurb for your book. And I was like, oh, shit. Wow. Okay. guess we're going to do the path over here. Uh, so then I had to do the serious blurbs. Um, I think what's interesting about him is, you know, th these motivations of folks are very complicated. But I think for Bill Gates, there is a sense, one, he's rich enough to be open-minded. And what I mean by that is, I found this a lot with my book. A lot of people at the very, very, very top of American life know exactly what I'm talking about. And actually, sometimes openly and sometimes privately agree with a lot of what I'm saying. It's the people who work for them. It's the staffers. It's the secretariat of the plutocracy. Um, it's the executive directors of their little institutes that actually are often so defensive of the plutocrats because they have to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a feeling that Bill Gates um, wouldn't certainly agree with much of my critique, but would possibly agree with the notion that there was a lot of there are a lot of folks out there, banks and other things, who are just using a kind of appearance of giving and not even doing the kind of stuff he's doing, like not actually deploying large resources and, and intellect to solve problems. And there's a whole bunch of things we can talk about what's problematic in his approach. But I think there was a, there was a sense of like him using this kind of thing to signal that what he does is different from what a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I forgot your original question. Oh, um, just some examples of, of um, the people you described. Yeah, so, so a good example would be um, the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma, um, which is now very much in the news because of the, the legal um, challenge to the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. you know, I, as of this moment, I believe 400,000 plus people have been killed by the opioid crisis. That's... Yeah. As, at least as far as I know, more people than COVID, or at least it's close. Um, those, I mean, that, those are like genocide numbers, right? Those are the kind of numbers you hear, like 400,000 people killed in country X, and you think, wow, we should, should we do a military intervention or, or what, right? 400,000 people killed in the United States by this opioids thing. And as has emerged in legal documents, you know, in, the, in a past case in West Virginia, and then more recently, um, sorry, in Virginia, and then more recently in, in nationwide cases, they knew what was going on. They, you know, did all manner of shenanigans to keep the government off their back and uh, kept keep the, the gravy train rolling. Well, you know, the Sackler family also, for most of this period, the drug was, you know, started getting big in the 90s. For most of this period, I would suspect if anybody on this podcast knows the name the Sackler family, um, my guess would be that you didn't know it in connection with the opioid crisis until a couple of years ago, but that you might well have known it in connection with the arts going back decades. You might've known about the Sackler Gallery in Washington or the Sackler Wing at the you know, Met or the Sackler Education Center or whatever it is at the Guggenheim. They sprinkled philanthropy, arts philanthropy, at Harvard as a Sackler Museum. Um, all over the world while they were doing this opioid stuff. And you got to ask yourself, it's very interesting. A lot of the places where, you know, West Virginia, McDowell County, West Virginia, one of the hardest hit places with this. A lot of the places where the opioids hit the hardest, rural places off the grid of power, um, you know, real power, not electric power. And, and you know, uh, down on their luck, exurbs, suburbs, rural areas. Interestingly, none of their arts philanthropy was in those areas. Their arts philanthropy was in London and New York and Chicago and San Francisco. Why? Why is that? Why is that? Because, look, all three of us on this podcast, where do we live? We live in those cities, right? So what did they want? They wanted the three of us over all these years to know that name in connection with the arts and not know that name 
in connection with a lot of people being killed in the opioid crisis. And until very, very recently, they succeeded. So that is a prime example of how generosity, it's not just a kind, sweet thing. It can be weaponized and used to perpetuate injustice. And Attorney General Letitia James of New York uh, in a really compelling uh, kind of almost essay, essay is not the right legal term, but you know, there, there was this kind of opening essay in the civil complaint that New York filed against the Sacklers and others involved in the opioid crisis. She really explained how this whole thing worked in a way that's kind of rare in these legal documents. And she talked about how they used arts philanthropy as a smoke screen to distract people from the fact that they were killing New Yorkers. Um, so that's you know a very prime example. Um, you know other examples may be you know Jeff Bezos donating a certain amount to you know preschool uh, for poor kids, kids from poor families, notwithstanding the fact that one of the reasons poor families are poor is people like Jeff Bezos doesn't pay them enough, right? So you imagine a work day where your three o'clock meeting is a meeting to discuss how to bust a union and make sure a union doesn't form at Whole Foods or a union doesn't form at your Amazon warehouse. And then your four o'clock meeting is a meeting about how to structure the new preschool you're creating for the children of the people whose union you just busted. This is the way in which our system works in this country. It is morally abhorrent, but it's also stupid and inefficient. It is a weird and uh, ungainly way of life to cause problems in your three o'clock meeting and then donate a fraction of the profits that you reaped from causing them to charity to help some of the people you're still hurting in your four o'clock meeting. And it's not just um, low wages, I think that you talk about in your book, but also the failure to pay a fair amount of tax so that you get to choose what you want to fund as opposed to paying your taxes and letting the American democratic system of government decide what your money will be used for. So that um, that's one of the points you make, I think. Is, is that not right? Yes. And, it, and it's really, we should just unpack that a little bit because I think that's an area where I think even people who are generally sympathetic to me on a whole bunch of this stuff will say, but come on on. And Bill Gates is so smart. Elon Musk is so smart. Choose your poison. You know, isn't it better if Elon or Bill or Jeff has a billion lying around? Isn't it better for them to deploy that money philanthropically uh, using their intelligence and solve some great problem instead of just throwing that billion into the general coffers of the US government where it may go to you know, uh, schools or it may go to a war or it may, right? And, and like that, in a way that's one of the most kind of compelling arguments I get back in my face. And the point you just made is incredibly important which is part of the reason we broke from the King of England is not just that we were ill-governed. It was a theory that in a way, it doesn't matter whether you're ill-governed or well-governed if you're governed in a way that gives you no say. And that the process matters, right? I mean, process matters is not a very exciting battle slogan, but in a way, what is the Declaration of Independence? The process matters, right? You look at all those grievances in the Declaration of Independence, like a lot of what they're saying is we want the opportunity to weigh in and make these decisions together, not have them rain on us. Mm -hmm. And so the problem with the Bill Gates is smart, let him fix the schools thing is that it is, you know, a kind of monarchy idea. It, it, it is a betrayal of the idea of democracy, which is that part of what makes our common institutions legitimate is that we make choices about them together. And that the act of trying, struggling to make choices together is itself an ennobling and deepening act uh, that it actually does produce better decisions in the long term, not always, but it does. But most importantly, 
and this is toward the end of my book, I talked to this political philosopher, um, Chicago-based Chiara Cordelli, at the University of Chicago, who, who makes this point that there's a, there's a fundamental moral difference between philanthropy and taxation, where when, when, a, when, a, when Bill Gates decides to like help some poor kids, um, the relationship, the power dynamic is the helper and the helped, right? The power dynamic is upstairs, downstairs. Um, it's kind of employer and servant in that relationship. Whereas when that same help, that same school, that same comes through our democratic institutions, each of us is actually both a subject and an object of the help. In other words, poor people benefiting from a special school funded by taxes of rich people are not only receiving that help, they also through our democratic institutions are givers of that help, right? Um, and it's, a, it's an abstract, but to me very important point that when we give to each other through our common institutions, we are all the protagonists of our own story. We are all making a decision together. Um, and that is incredibly different from seeking social progress um, through you know, waiting for rich people to make it rain. I hear you saying seeking to do things together. And this is a little off the subject, but given the events of January 6th, together is a word, uh, and this goes also to your saying, words matter. Uh, and to my hashtag on Twitter, say this, not that, because I also think words matter, and that we should call things what they are. I worry about whether we'll ever get back to a, a time when we do have one unified decision of the country, but uh, I don't know. Do you want to comment on that, or should we go back? Well, to I don't. I don't think we need a un. I don't think we need unity, in the sense that you know. I mean, like I've seen unity, and it looks like North Korean parliament sessions. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm glad we don't have unity. You know, I'm glad we have cacophony, and I'm glad we have variety. I think the the I would define the problem slightly differently as we're not having the same conversation in this country right now. That, you know, a, like a divide on its own is not problematic to me. I want there to be divide. Divides are very productive. Different people seeing the world in different ways and hashing it out and, you know. Um, I think the question is like, how does your divide operate, right? There are divides in every country in the world. The divides in our country at every moment in time. But divides can be generative and productive when there's certain kind of behaviors that go along with those divides. When you say, you know what? I mean, I, you know, you, you tell me about your Watergate experience, but I, I listened to the, the slow burn podcast of it. And one of the things that was really striking to me, just viscerally having read about Watergate, but just listening to this, the committee hearings and stuff is like, there's all these Republicans who at the beginning were like in lockstep with Nixon. And then they would like hear something. They would like hear a tape or they'd hear a piece of evidence and then live in the committee, you could, they, you could hear people being like, well, that's really terrible. And mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with that, right? And you heard people who were like, they were like human beings. Like they, they had a thing they thought, then something happened, information you know, emerged as that, they say in that movie, new shit came to light and then they changed. And that basic thing is, there's no, there's no divide that is intrinsically problematic if that is going on, if you kind of have a circulatory system of opinions. But ours is completely clotted right now. And that to me is actually the real problem. I, I agree with you and you've said better than I did. The word unity is not probably what I was going for. What I'm going for is that we don't have a common set of facts. So we right. have no way of having an intelligent, productive conversation you mentioned Watergate. During that time, we had three networks and only three. We had NBC, ABC, CBS, and they all had the same facts. There was no dispute on that. There was debate on what the proper solution to the facts were. But you're right when you say that Republicans listening to the facts said, oh, that's a fact. That is true. That means that Richard Nixon must leave office. And we don't have that now. And that's what I'm worried about is how do we get back to having a civil dialogue so that we can agree on things. But let's go back to your book. And 
uh, sort of a more generic question that, that I'm always interested in is what inspired you to write this book? Was there an aha moment where you went, oh my God, I see a problem I have to document? Or was this something that built up over a long time? What, what made you write it? It was exactly both of those things and in a way an intersection of those things, you know? So it was funny, I, after the book came out or was nearly done, I hadn't remembered this before, but I, I wrote, I found a column I had written in 2011 in the New York Times. And the column, the headline was Real Change Requires Politics. And it was about social, the rise of social entrepreneurship and all these kind of business to save the world things. And I was making this argument that that's not real change and it's not how, you know, so in a way, and the book came out seven years later. So I realized that I was kind of onto this and thinking about this long before. And, and part of why I was, was just generational watching, you know, when you're, when you're, it's interesting. I mean, I'm 39 now. In that period between kind of when you're 25 and 35, let's say, you know, when you're 25, well, you and all your friends, people you went to school with, everybody's doing various things. No one's doing the thing they're going to end up doing. It's kind of, you know, and then by the time thir you're 35, like most people have gotten on their track and you kind of see lives forming. And as I watched that process of lives forming among peers of my generation, I saw all these people who believed in the public good, believed in public service, but were activists, were you know, political operatives in their youth. And by the time they're 35, like most of them are working in like these various forms of kind of business to change the world. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's working at Uber and being told you're like bringing micro entrepreneurship to communities or whatever the story is. So that was a kind of, there are many kind of deep running sources of it. And I'm also just very attentive to language and propaganda. And I just was very attentive to like all this language around me of, you know, change the world, change. Why are all these CEOs saying change the world? Why are they all talking about making a difference? Anytime you hear a lot of that kind of message, I, I get very suspicious. Um, but the shorter run thing that kind of intersected with that longer run observation was I got this, uh, something I write about in the acknowledgments of the book, I got this fellowship at the Aspen Institute um, in 2011. And, you know, it's kind of this, like I describe it as like a benevolent open secret society. Um, and it, it's sort of this group of people who gather uh, a few times a year over two years to talk about how to make the world a better place. And this particular fellowship is actually mostly business people. Uh, as you can imagine, 20 business people in a room talking together is incredibly boring. So they would often bring in one or two or three non-business people to spice things up, a comedian, an artist, a painter, whatever. Um, I was the like Indian spice of my class. Um, and so we did this exercise and we kind of read Gandhi and read this and that and talked about comedy. And the whole purpose was to get most of these business people actually thinking about purpose and thinking about not just making money, but transitioning to making a difference in society, whatever. That was great. And, you know, then I, there were these summer reunions that came with this thing, go to Aspen, it's so nice. And I would go to these things and look around. And I'm ashamed that I didn't pick up on this completely within five minutes, that it actually took me, you know, a little time to see this. But it would occur to me that there were a bunch of people there in Aspen in a seminar room named after the Koch brothers. So we're like in the Koch seminar building, right? And I was sitting in a room with people talking about how to make America better or the world better on some issue. And when I actually like looked at their name cards or looked at information about them, it dawned on me that some of those people had literally flown into Aspen from causing those problems. Like their last engagement before going to Aspen was causing the problems that they were flying to Aspen to solve, right? So they would be at Goldman Sachs and pushing to create an economy that worked for fewer and fewer people and being totally down with that. And then flying to Aspen and talking about how do we fight inequality? And earnestly being on these panels talking about no, no sense of irony around it, you know? Or they'd be at, you know, um, Pepsi talk, and just doing their job of trying to get as much sugar into, you know, young people's bodies as possible. And then 
you know, you'd see Indra Nui sitting in front of me at the Aspen, some Aspen event, you know, and they're doing a panel on nutrition and justice or food deserts or whatever. And just everybody's uh, waxing eloquently about the need to empower marginalized youth and, you know, and it just occurred to me, like, we're flying here to talk about the problem, but the people flying here are the problem. Like we, you know, and so um, I was asked to give a talk there, which was not that unusual actually, because they had a kind of rule against outside speakers. So everyone, they would ask one person to give a speech, another person kind of at some point, everybody sat on a panel, everybody gave a talk, everybody. So I was asked to give this talk. They asked me to talk about my second book, The True American, which is about a murder case and the hate crimes in Texas. And I said, sure. And then I sat down to write it and I was like, I actually want to give a different speech to these people, but I don't think I should tell them. So I just told them it would be slightly different than what I said. And they're like, oh yeah, absolutely no problem. And I wrote a obviously completely different speech in secret, um, basically suggesting to them that they were the problem that they were trying to solve. Um, that How were you greeted with that? It was a very surreal thing. Um, you know, the first thing that happened was I got a standing ovation with icy stares. <laughs> you know, um, so there was a there was a somewhat performative element of like, oh, like this is wonderful stuff, you know. Um, and a woman came up to me right after, and she was like, "Qué cojones!" And then a private equity guy came up to me a little while later and put his hand out shook my hand and he said, you're an asshole. <laughs> um, and Madeline Albright uh, was the next speaker. So she went up on stage right after me and she kind of obliquely was like, I'm not sure what that was about, but I think America is a great country and the Aspen Institute's a great institute. And it was a little bit like, <laughs> not like I said, you know. But, um, Careful what you say. She's one of my heroes. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sure she's, she's, a, she's a formidable woman. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a moment where it was supposed to be for the room. What happened that day? I had actually asked for it to be only in the room. I, I had them turn off the live stream. I wanted to speak to the group. Um, and the funny thing happened, which is that David Brooks was in the room because he was speaking there the next day. And he's been connected to the Institute for a while. And he uh, basically asked me if he, it was like a, a Thursday, I think. And if you know anything about newspaper columnists, you know when their column day is coming up, their script. It was a Wednesday, actually. So his columns are Tuesday and Friday, I think. So he had to write his column on a Thursday. So it's Wednesday night. The guy's getting nervous, like all columnists, and uh, desperate for material. And so he asked me, do you mind if I write a column about your speech? Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, sure, great. Sounds great. So I gave him the text of the speech. He writes a column about it. Now there's a column in the New York Times, which I didn't entirely, I mean, even though I worked for the New York Times, I didn't entirely understand the power of a David Brooks column can unleash on the world. So now suddenly everybody's like, where's the speech? Where's the speech? Because he embraced, he was like, he was like, this is a really meaningful and critique of capitalism that is different from the familiar arguments of yesteryear. This is a new frontier battle. He kind of went through three of my reasons for making these critiques that were different from what he felt he'd heard in the past. And suddenly everybody was like, where was, where's the speech? If there's this column about it. So I put, the text online and then I got the video up, put the video online and it kind of just exploded. It was like this kind of viral moment. Um, and my agent, um, who's very much not online, um, sort of not of the online generation, but has formidable instincts called me and she's like, this is your next book. And I was like, that's not my next book. I'm trying to do a book about this or that. She's like, you don't choose these moments. This is your next book. Wow, that's that's amazing. All right. Well, maybe let's let's end this podcast by talking about the solutions, uh, because you say the system needs fixing. Um, where do you find the solutions lie? Is it in government? Is it in legislation? Is it in ordinary people uh, doing something to deal with the massive wealth on the other side? Um, and finally, what about young people? Uh, we always try to include some advice for Victor's generation. 
Um, it, it, and so I'd like to hear what you think the solutions are and what- Yeah, I mean, I, I, at the highest level, I would say, we have to change where we go to change the world. In our time, there has been a big story. The dominant story of our time is the way you change the world is through business, is through private enterprise. That the way you change the world is, you know, is through the things we do alone. And the whole purpose of the book is to make a case for people that the real way you make change is the real way we've always made change, which is from below in concert with others through democratic institutions. Women didn't get suffrage uh, through people throwing coins at them. Uh, you know, slavery did not end in America um, because of the kindness of a handful of plantation owners. Um, you know, children's little fingers didn't get out of the factories because factory owners changed their mind about, you know, the, the productivity of those fingers. Um, virtually nothing important that has happened in this country's history to advance social progress and make people live with more dignity um, it has happened through, you know, uh, the concessions of the powerful. It is always uh, power has to be to be redistributed and often taken through politics. Um, and, you know, uh, you look at this podcast for various reasons in American history, it, perhaps different reasons in each of our cases, but various reasons that amount to a single story. Probably none of the three of us would have been in the position to do the work we do and be in this conversation. Um, or have gone through the institutions we've gone through, but for political changes waged by others, not the private kindnesses of anybody, right? I certainly wouldn't be here without changing the immigration laws in the 1960s. So it didn't matter what employers were feeling or anybody else was feeling, those laws weren't changed. I'm not part of the American story, which you know, some of my critics would prefer. Um, and so the question then becomes, on the biggest shared problems we have. And to be clear, I'm not talking about everything. I'm fine with most activities in American life being private activity. They always will be. I want my phone very much you know, invented by private companies and this laptop very much invented by private companies and you know, the light bulbs, private companies, air travel, private companies. Bernie Sanders isn't proposing to change any of that. But on the biggest shared problems we have, how do you have racial justice? How do you empower women to play all their many roles? How do you uh, deal with um, legacies of apartheid in America? How do you deal with income inequality that has turned the future into a kind of rainwater that only rich people harvest? On those types of problems, as the feminists taught us, there are no personal solutions at this time. There are just no personal solutions to those problems. Climate change, to name another. You're not going to light bulb your way out of climate change. Women are not going to lean in their way out of patriarchy, right? Um, you know, black people are not going to entrepreneur their way out of systemic racism. And all of these kind of false promises of personal emancipation have distracted us from the solution that's always been the only solution for this kind of progress in our country, which is politics and doing things together. And the fact that our politics are so broken that we could have a terrorist insurrection ordered by the president of the United States last week is obviously dispiriting. It is very dispiriting for this view, but it's sort of like your family. Like you don't get another family just because your family is in a bad situation. It's still your family. This is still your democracy. And I think we're going to have to figure out the most urgent work. Um, and this is where it gets to the, the question for Victor's generation. The most urgent work would be to make politics once again a place where we can go to solve our biggest shared problems. Yeah, that, that is definitely for sure. And you know, my generation, I think, has done an exceptional job in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements and really building those um, mass movements with young people. Um, but, you know, we don't want to give away everything in your book. And I know that your book talks through um, perhaps for me, one of the most engaging parts of your book is just you going through just the real life examples like Hillary Cohen, who's a young person who's idealistic or, um, you know, Amy Cuddy, who's a TED Talk person. And, um, you know, so we want all of our listeners and viewers to go read that book. But, um, you know, this has been such an enlightening conversation. We 
are really appreciative for all that you do and for spending some time with us today. And I Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed talking with you both. Thank you. And I would say that uh, anybody who listened to this would find you completely engaging and mm -hmm. and um, would be interested in reading the book. So thank you for being with us and explaining what you wrote about.